All right. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really good to, to, to be at a conference again with all the challenges of uh, rediscovering how to do the presentations live again. Um, so today uh, I'll be talking about uh, how we've been using GitOps at CERN um, and especially the needs we have for multi-cluster, multi-cloud deployments, uh, some, some quite large deployments we have to handle. So w where this all comes from. And then hopefully I'll leave some time for Q&A. So very quickly, I'm a computer engineer at CERN. Uh, I work on containerization, uh, Kubernetes, also some machine learning and accelerators. I also do some work in the CNCF um, in the TOC and uh, I co-lead the res CNCF research uh, user group. Uh, so CERN has a quite large uh, uh, private cloud. Uh, the Kubernetes deployments are also uh, quite significant. We have more than 600 clusters, uh, like thousands of nodes, uh, tens of, uh, more than 10,000 cores today running on Kubernetes. So it's pretty significant. And this is our world on premises. And this is where I will start to talk today is to describe uh, what are the needs we have to, to support uh, this, this uh, kind of infrastructure and what we try to do to, to uh, um, ensure like high availability, uh, proper upgrades, and how we use GitOps to, to help with this. So starting on our on-premises world, uh, the reason we decided to go with multiple clusters and not have very large clusters, uh, there's quite a, quite a few reasons for that. The first one is uh, to isolate workloads to have some sort of multi-tenancy by just split, splitting cl clusters. The state today probably would allow us to do it differently, but uh, there's, there's still quite, quite some advantages to doing it like this. Also, we had some issues with the uh, control plane of the cluster not uh, necessarily working always very well, so kind of splitting clusters reduces the blast radius as well. When we do upgrades, this is another area that we struggled quite a bit, so uh, just doing cluster replacement instead of uh, actual upgrades of the clusters uh, is uh, is uh, another way to to handle this, and I'll talk a bit of, more about that. And initially, we also had this this need to split clusters to get access to heterogeneous resources. This is not necessarily true today, but it's still something in some cases we need. Uh, so when you start handling multi-cluster and deployments over multiple clusters, uh, being able to do it in an automated and fast way uh, is key, and GitOps is uh, is the answer we 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 used. So when we start looking at how we did this, uh, if we look at the past, like before we moved to containerized deployments, we were using uh, traditional VMs or, or physical machines uh, and using things like Chef or Puppet to deploy, uh, mostly Puppet at CERN. Um, and in reality, if you were a service manager, very most of your work would be done already in Git by just updating the here values for Puppet. Uh, the configuration in Puppet, and then this would propagate to the node. So it, the, the notion of like doing GitOps was kind of uh, there already in, in this uh, way of interfacing with the deployments. Uh, this is also very nice to introduce people to containerization and to Kubernetes. A lot of them will, will go through a quite steep learning curve to, to start using Kubernetes, and if they can start just by editing YAML, and uh, doing configuration changes in the multiple deployments this way, they can more confidently build knowledge of the Kubernetes stack as well. Um, and then when, when, when we start doing this, uh, then we also gain all the benefits of using Kubernetes and containerization, which is to avoid con configuration drift by having immutable deployments, uh, uh, the much better reconcil reconciliation of the deployments that uh, Kubernetes allows, by having this declaratively, declarative state that then propagates to, to the different applications and services. So how do we do this in, internally? Um, we have this notion of clusters as cattle, uh, very much like VMs as cattle existed before. So we try to have multiple clusters serving the same, the same uh, application or service. So on the left side, we see like a load balancer on top that will split the, the load from one service across different clusters with 50-50 uh, distribution. Uh, if we want to upgrade this cluster, say we have two clusters running one, uh, Kubernetes 121, we want to upgrade the cluster to 122. We actually usually don't do in-place in upgrades apart from a few exceptions. We just add a new cluster we configure in our, GitHub, in, in our GitOps deployments that the, the service should direct like 20% to this new cluster, gain some confidence with, the, confidence with the new deployment, 
and eventually this will allow us to slowly get rid of the old clusters and move the, the workloads. We can also do things like uh, uh, cluster auto-scaling to size the clusters according to the load they have. Uh, so one, one key thing we do here is that, uh, and this is something that you will also configure in our uh, Git, uh, Git configurations, is that you will need to, to have uh, a way to expose a service type load balancer into a single uh, central load balancer instance. Uh, and this we do by having a slight change on the normal cloud provider, where we say this service should actually link to this uh, load balancer pool with this UID, and this allows us to, to do this spread of the spread of the load. So from this state, the, where we had uh, three clusters, uh, one with 122 with 20%, then eventually we moved to what we have here on the left, where we got rid of one of the old clusters, and then we split the, the load half-half between the 121 and 122 clusters. And with time, we deploy a new 122, and we get rid of the old ones. And this is kind of how we do uh, the upgrades of clusters. One thing that is pretty obvious here is that if you don't have a very good automation of your deployments, uh, this is extremely hard to maintain. So this is uh, where we put our investment. Uh, the other part that I would like to discuss uh, uh, regarding our on-premise deployments is even for, for components that need to be kept up to date, even if you're doing like a, a version clusters with the Kubernetes versions, there are a lot of components you will have to do security patches and do small upgrades with time, even within the same cluster. Uh, so we keep this, uh, we have this idea of release channels uh, where we try to have um, each of the clusters linked to a branch uh, of our GitOps configuration uh, where we evolve them independently. So for example, say you have a 122 cluster, you will link it to a, a 22 branch that has all the configurations we want for that specific Kubernetes versions for the base components uh, in the cluster. And you can also choose if you want like a stable or a kind of more development branch that or QA uh, that will allow us to, to like roll out uh, uh, gradually the changes first in QA, then in stable. So the recommendation here would be that you have your version clusters, but also you have uh, maybe a QA and a stable cluster so that you can validate in your deployments all the changes as we roll them out gradually. Uh, so this, this is um, like how we try to, to structure our deployments in a way that uh, gives us confidence in for upgrades of the different components. So if you, if one, one, one key thing is that uh, when you deploy a cluster at CERN, you actually deploy also what we call a, an umbrella Helm chart. And this uh, Helm chart has a bunch of uh, dependencies that have basically all the, the, the base components we need in a cluster. So you can see here base, which is like, a, again, a kind of a multi-component chart. But then EOS is our storage system, uh, the GPU um, deployments, um, Fluent D to, to forward the logs to, to our central log collection, some internal components here uh, and storage, and there's a bunch more. And what you do when you deploy your cluster, you basically can, you, all you have to do is specify this uh, um, values file that uh, has like the base definitions in, in, our, in, the, in, in the chart itself with the, the versions we recommend, but actually users can override uh, these values if they want. So they might disable, enable some of the features, or for example, for Fluentd, we have this notion of a producer that will tag the logs with the, with the application that is forwarding them so that then we can do correlations between the different services. So all these pieces allow us to, to have um, um, like quite simple way of uh, uh, managing all the dependencies and quite simple way of managing all the, the multiple deployments we have, which like, uh, as I mentioned, it's like more than 600 clusters today. So uh, when we do that, like uh, getting people into GitOps, uh, a lot of our users uh, will probably just start with writing some, some YAML files uh, with their deployments and the, all the Kubernetes resources they need. But actually, when you, when you want to onboard them uh, with GitOps, well, it's quite essential to, to do a, a very uh, big push for training and dissemination. So this is what we've been doing the last maybe two or three years. Um, um, people uh, need to know, like, if I want, if I have multiple clusters, how do I handle the load in my services, uh, the, the distribution, or if you're running some sort of batch uh, workload, 
how do you redirect the batch uh, jobs to the multiple clusters? How do you handle like uh, the queues in the different clusters? Things like this. So we wrote a couple of uh, simple uh, getting started uh, tutorials. Uh, I, I think they are open, so you can have a look. They are getting outdated because we, we these, these tutorials are still for Flux and Argo CD v1. We actually started by writing one with Flux, and uh, this was the main tool we were using. Uh, some users uh, started using Argo CD as well, so they, one of them actually forked our tutorial and wrote uh, uh, the equivalent in Argo CD. These tutorials will tell you everything from like recommending the structure and uh, how to handle environments uh, using either uh, multiple directories or branches to, to managing secrets uh, with something like SOPs. So in both cases, we actually rely on SOPs for secrets. Um, so this is something we push internally quite a bit. And uh, this is the key to, to being able to have this uh, multi-cluster um, uh, deployments that we, we want to keep. So now, after we did this, we started jumping to, to the public cloud. And uh, this brings uh, quite a lot of challenges. I will mention a few. Uh, but, it, but there is one good thing is that uh, because we already rely on the Kubernetes API and all the Kubernetes ecosystem for most of these deployments, uh, most public cloud providers uh, offer these managed Kubernetes services where a lot of it can be reused. And this, is, this was the key to, to like ease our transition to the public cloud. Uh, there are quite a few motivations for an organization like CERN to, to use the public cloud, even if we have a very large data center and access to quite a lot of resources internally. But one thing, uh, um, if you imagine like CERN will have a constant load uh, in, our, in our servers, but we also have like uh, uh, physics conferences that come, for example, during the summer, where people will have uh, a need to, to run a lot more analysis than usual. And this comes with periodical load spikes. If, if we would provision our resources uh, on-premises to, to this kind of load, we would have um, quite a lot of waste during the rest of the year. So there's a motivation to do on-demand, uh, to use on-demand resources for this, to cover for this. Uh, and then with, the, with a lot of machine learning happening uh, everywhere, but also at CERN, um, we have a, a need to, for a large amount of accelerators. And these are like GPUs and dedicated accelerators like TPUs and IPUs. For GPUs, we have some in-house, but we need a lot more. So we try to go to the public cloud for, for, the, for these extra resources. For TPUs, which are these uh, tensor processing units from, from Google, for example, uh, we, we can't have them on premises. They still have a value, so we, we use them on the public cloud. Um, also, we use uh, public cloud resources to get access to new uh, type of resources and evaluate, it, evaluate them before doing big tenders on premises. And uh, also, disaster recovery is one of the use cases we have. So it's quite a different use from what we had on premises, but in reality, because we already had this multi-cluster um, uh, um, deployments, we kind of knew how to, to manage this in a similar way. So just, just a very brief uh, thing uh, regarding the, the needs for, for public cloud, just to give you an idea of why we need this. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did a keynote at KubeCon where we did an analysis in, in five minutes of uh, where we analyzed 70 terabytes of data uh, using a Kubernetes stack. And this works very well when we prove that uh, we can scale we can scale our, uh, our uh, deployments for this kind of um, load we need. Um, but actually, and yeah, we built the, the Higgs plot the, that gave the Nobel Prize in, in 2013 live on stage. This was a really nice way to say, okay, we can use the public cloud for real things. But then regarding the deployment, this was kind of a, a, kind of a stunt. Uh, we, we did a one once, uh, once, once in a time deployment which is not really useful for anything else. So we didn't even get halfway to what we need to, to, to use the public cloud in, um, in a generic way. Um, things that we, will, we knew we, we would need is supporting multi -cloud, multiple cloud providers. We cannot uh, uh, um, have one single provider. Um, support multiple regions. If you use the public cloud, you know that uh, the resources available in different regions uh, can vary. So you, it, you need to be flexible in this way. 
Uh, then the integration with our in-house tools. I mentioned like storage systems, but we have a lot more that we, we need to kind of propagate to the public cloud for our applications to be able to run. Uh, we need to have some sort of centralized monitoring and log collection, tracing of the applications. So deploy at uh, multiple public clouds, but also collect it centrally. And then accounting, costing, um, and yeah, you can keep adding things that you need when you start using the public cloud. But again, we, we had these components well-structured. Uh, we had a, an API that is well, uh, available in all the cloud providers. So there was, there was quite a lot of uh, work already there. I will just mention uh, in the same way that I had this, uh, this, I had this slide about uh, doing things at scale just to uh, strengthen the, the need for the public cloud for us. But on the other hand, uh, we also learned that the resources are not infinite, even in the public cloud. Uh, if you use CPUs at tens of thousands, uh, you're probably okay. But if you start going larger than that, uh, you might need to go multi-region. If you're using GPUs, this can happen even in 1,000 GPUs or, or a couple of thousand. You probably want to start splitting the regions. And there's one thing that is like, uh, the cloud can, you can have a huge benefit if you use things like preemptable spot instances that are really cost effective. And uh, the availability of this is also quite limited. So you need to be kind of smart and exploring multi-region also to, to reduce the costs here. So the, the main message I, I, I wanted to put here is that these are, just, these are really reasons to, to really stay flexible on your choice of uh, not only clouds, but even regions within the same cloud. And in the same way that I explained that to have multi-cluster on-premises, we need to have automation in GitOps. If you go multi-cloud, multi-region, this is even more important. So I'll, I'll finish with this, uh, with this example. Uh, I was talking to Cornelia about uh, machine learning just before. So we have some cool machine learning use cases and to, to have an idea like if we, we have use cases, uh, one GPU, you might take like a, a an hour to do a single epoch and then just by using the public cloud and exploring resources we, we can speed up a uh, hundred times that uh, so at the same cost so so th there is really a, a push to, to explore this resource so i will try to spend the rest of the presentation describing how we handle the public cloud it's quite similar uh, in terms of uh, the stack we had on premises what we add here is that we start managing the clusters themselves using GitOps. Uh, this is this is, wasn't the case before. People would deploy their clusters and then register um, um, by using Flux or Argo CD uh, where the applications should be coming from, and and add this to the cluster. But in the in the public cloud, because we ha we need this flexibility of multiple clouds, multiple regions, we started looking at can we actually do the same for what we call the underlay, which is the clusters themselves. So we would have basically three three parts that we would need. We would need to support the clusters, multiple clouds, multiple regions, and manage them um, in an automated way. Have the base services I mentioned, and then manage the applications themselves. So we end up with three groups of components. The first one is again the underlay, the clusters themselves, the infrastructure, the base services that we need on all the clusters for applications to, to be able to run. And then the services and applications themselves, which are cluster specific, and we will allocate them to different clusters uh, as needed. Um, so we do this by having a single Git repository where we have all the configuration for the clusters, for all the definitions of the base services, uh, and the association of the services and applications with each of the clusters. So all the complexity of a very um, large deployment with, I don't know, you might be having a deployment with uh, um, AWS, uh, Azure, and uh, the Google Cloud, in multiple regions, and basically you, you are looking at a single repository to, ma to manage all of this. So this is an, a view with the Argo CD, where we have, uh, again, this infrastructure, uh, the underlay, sorry, and then the infrastructure, and then the services and, and the applications running. And we use this notion of like app of apps that I think in V2 is called an application set, uh, but it, it's the same concept where we aggregate things into groups. So this is the view of uh, what the deployment would look like uh, uh, at CERN. Uh, so 
we have one cluster at CERN that basically is responsible for managing all the public cloud deploy deployments. And uh, this will count uh, the definition of the clusters and then the definition of the base services. So again, you might have a cluster in GCP, say West Europe, West 4 uh, region. And then each, each in this cluster, we'll have multiple node groups and we will have node groups that auto scale, for example, for different types of GPUs and then maybe a, a TPU. And then we'll have a similar one where we have, for example, and here we see the need to have multiple, multiple uh, regions. Uh, for example, in West 4, you won't have uh, NVIDIA T4s. We need to go to West 1 to get the T4s. So basically, we need already two regions here just because of the access to different types of resources. And then we need AWS because this is where we get uh, ARM, uh, Graviton 2. And then we need Azure for GPUs or IPUs, for example. So this can be quite complex to manage, but in reality, uh, at CERN, what we have is one big YAML file, one very big YAML file, uh, that uh, basically tells you for all the clusters I need, uh, I call it like this, this is GCP cloud, um, and then I tell it the, the region I want to use, the cluster version, and then the different node pools that I need to, to have. So in this case, like I have a node pool for NVIDIA A100 GPUs, and you would see this continuing. Um, and then the, the system, uh, the, the key thing here, if we're talking about clusters, is that uh, the cluster has to become a, uh, a Kubernetes resource, uh, which is not uh, like um, the Kubernetes cluster being a Kubernetes resource is kind of like the complicated to, to to start with, but, but actually this is a really good idea. The same way we do the declaration and reconciliation of any kind of resource in, in Kubernetes, we can do for, for, for um, cloud resources as well. So for that, we rely on a, a project called Crossplane, uh, where um, they have this notion of a provider for the different clouds. Uh, so in this case, you see like a template where we define a GKE cluster uh, with, uh, with the name and then for a bunch of node pools, um, uh, like a template for a node pool that will define uh, like the max mean node count, uh, which kind of accelerator it should use, if any, uh, the type of uh, image and disk that it should use. And this, this is basically expanded based on this YAML file that I showed you here. So again, uh, one single Git repo allows us to, to do all of this. So. If you look at our Argo deployment in this case, it will be really large, but with this uh, app of apps and navigation, you can you kind of get a nice uh, uh, feedback loop all the way up in the status of the resources. And you can see the reconciliation happening in, in two cases here. So in this case, uh, we, we added an EKS cluster that is being uh, reconciled. And then you can see for, for I had this West 4 uh, example cluster with all the node pools, and you can see that they are already reconciled. So the up, the layer above this is the infrastructure layer. Again, this is extremely similar to what we do on premises, but it does have some some uh, particularities because, um, say for example, uh, at CERN we have this registry which uh, is based on Harbor. Then we have Prometheus. Now, if we start having this uh, very distributed infrastructure, we started looking at how to, to handle this. So we, we actually deploy Thanos. And in each of the clusters on the cloud, in each of the regions um, um, that we, we have a cluster deployment, you will have a, replicated, a replication ver, uh, of all these services. So the registry will also be deployed there. And in addition to that, we also define like the replication rules of which images should be replicated uh, in advance. And uh, um, like proxy caches, if we need any, any kind of policies, for example, things that we want to express is uh, who can run in this cluster in this cloud. Uh, and we use uh, uh, based on, on labels, for example, that have to come with the applications, some storage systems that we need and uh, the monitoring as well. So this is uh, something that is quite easy to, to, to deploy and uh, in most cases, these are like Helm charts or, uh, I don't know, customized uh, based deployments. In other cases, like the replication rules, we, have, we actually have small tools that will do API calls to the, to the systems. And um, this is a, a view of uh, like what a dashboard would look. So in, in, if you would have the on-premises GPU monitoring, 
you would see uh, like a single cluster, a couple of clusters on premises. Here you can actually see also like per cloud, you can do an aggregation of the queries. Uh, in reality for the service man managers, this is all hidden. Uh, they don't really uh, have to bother with all the details of the deployments. All they care is about these dashboards. And one key thing that is also important is um, um, our users don't really see all this complexity. Uh, they care about the services they use daily. So what we do is we integrate, uh, for example, we integrate to the GitLab. I, here I, I give an example of a GitLab CI. We have a bunch of runners to run, for example, jobs on GPUs. Uh, we had already the integration with Kubernetes on-premises. We actually integrated the runners also with our external cloud premises. So this would be one of the applications running across all these clusters, GitLab runners. And our users will just submit via GitLab uh, their CI jobs, and uh, they will run anywhere that uh, is appropriate, but they won't realize this. So it's kind of uh, a nice way to, to expose all this uh, to the end users. And we do this for, with uh, like machine learning, uh, machine learning uh, frameworks as well, where the, the jobs, like a distributed training job, might run on-premises on the public cloud, depending on whatever is happening uh, without much trouble. So I come to the end. Uh, uh, so basically, we, we are like GitOps is the key for us to be able to manage uh, hundreds of clusters on premises, uh, like thousands of deployments, uh, tens of uh, clusters already on multiple clouds and regions. Uh, so we use GitOps for the base services, but we started using them for, for the clusters themselves. And uh, you can add a, a cluster to our infrastructure on any public cloud and have it serving production workloads in less than 15 minutes, which is quite an achievement with all this stack that we rely on. Uh, the flexibility also allow, this flexibility also allows us to have much more cost-effective cost deployments. And then the Kubernetes API is really the common language and all the, the ecosystem is the enabler for all of this. So if you are maintaining um, any of these projects and are contributing to them, like we have to say thank you. Yeah, you, you are helping us in a, in a huge way. And with that, I come to the questions if there are any. Hopefully there's time. Um, we have several questions if any, if any of our attendees can access these slides later on. Yeah, sure, I can okay. upload to the to the Wonderful. agenda, yeah. All right. If any other questions? Given that you're connecting from your on-premises system to multiple different cloud providers, how do you handle the networking between your, your own data centers and the public cloud? Right, so um, it depends on the service. Uh, for most of the use cases, like I, I mentioned GitLab CI runners, uh, they will just pick a job uh, and run the job in the public cloud. It really depends on what the job needs. If the job only needs, for example, uh, access to our storage systems, we have this replication in place of whatever storage system is needed. One of the base services is this, this replication to, to kind of extend the storage to the to, the, to that region. Uh, in some cases, if the service really needs uh, tight interconnectivity, you need some sort of like VPN set up between the, the, the different data centers. Uh, we, we, we don't have a lot of use cases onboarded into our public cloud deployments that need that. We, we really use them for kind of batch, uh, like uh, um, totally independent workloads that fit much better without this uh, need for interconnectivity. Thank you.